Conrad Steiner, Doctor of Medicine. Tonight's story has the title, Pray Judgment. Guardian of birth, healer of the sick, comforter of the aged. And the qualities of the worthy physician are three. The eye of an eagle, the heart of a lion, the hand of a woman. Our actual case history tonight concerns one aspect of legal medicine. The object in point, a baby's pillow. The case in point, Dr. Charles Bowden. Dr. Bowden is somewhat different from most doctors. Although he practices medicine, he treats no one, he cures no one, and he pays official calls only to the dead. I'm Dr. Bowden. Is this the Rockwell home? Yes. I'm Dr. Marvin, the pediatrician. Would you come this way, please? I examined the child only three days ago. Routine checkup. He was in perfect health. Have the parents been notified? They should be here any minute now. That's the babysitter downstairs. No, that's Miss Grayson. Miss Rockwell's older sister. She was alone with the baby when it happened. I see. What time did you get here, doctor? Miss Grayson called me about 12.30. I got here about... 12.45. I found the baby just as you did, lying face down on the pillow. Body warmth uh, partially retained. Mm -hmm. uh, what did uh, Miss Grayson have to say? She's not too clear about it. Almost hysterical when I first got here. Must be the parents now. Laura. Kathy, please believe me, Kathy. What happened? Where's my baby? Where's my baby? Upstairs. The doctors are with him. <laughs> I didn't mean it, Kathy. <laughs> I didn't mean it, Kathy. I didn't do anything. I didn't mean it. <laughs> Baby's full name, Mr. Rockwell? Jerry. Jerry, Jr. His full name, please. Gerald Thomas Rockwell, Jr. Baby's age? Three months. Look, Doctor, can't this wait? Do you have to go on asking these questions at a time like this? I'm sorry, Mr. Rockwell, believe me. At a time like this is when a physician from the coroner's office has to ask questions. I don't understand what the coroner's office has got to do with all this. Do you investigate crimes, things like that? Not only that. By law, the coroner's office investigates all sudden and unexpected deaths. How's Kathy? She's feeling any better? A little. I've been trying to get her to take a sedative. She refuses. I wish I knew what to say, Jerry. I wish it were in my power to give him back to you. Hello? Yes, just a minute. For you, Dr. Marvin. 
Dr. Marvin? Yes. What was that address again? Yes. All right. That was my exchange, Jerry. Emergency call. I'll have to be going. Anything more I can do for you, Dr. Bowden? I don't think so. Thank you very much, Doctor. Good night, Mr. Grayson. If I can be of any help, I wish you'd call me. All right. Good night. Miss Grayson, would you tell me exactly what happened after your sister and Mr. Rockwell left the house, please? I went back upstairs to my room for a while. What time was that? It was a little after 8.30, I think. I don't remember exactly. I read a magazine for a while. Then I went to the baby's room to see if he was covered. He was perfectly all right. He was asleep on his stomach. About what time would that have been, Miss Grace? Must have been about 10 o'clock. After I left the baby, I came down here. I listened to some music over the radio. After about a half an hour, I heard the baby cry a little. Then he was quiet. Did you go up and take a look at him when he cried? No. There didn't seem to be any need to. After a while, I must have drowsed off. Then when I woke up, I noticed that I was late for the baby's midnight bottle. It was 12.15. So I went to the kitchen and warmed his bottle. Then I took it up to him. Well, I put it down by his crib. That's when I noticed it. His face was buried in the pillow. Then I tried to wake him up, but he wouldn't move. He wouldn't wake up. His lips were blue. <laughs> All right, Miss Grayson. Thank you very much. <laughs> Doctor, if you're finished, I'd like to go on up to my wife. There is one thing more. We'll have to take the baby down to the coroner's office. Why? For an examination. An autopsy? Try to think of it as something we should do. Actually, it's something we have to do if we are to learn the real cause of his death. You owe it to yourselves. It's for your own peace of mind. Will it take long? Not very long. All right. I'll call the coroner's ambulance. Hello? Dr. Bowden. I want an ambulance at 133 Palm Drive. Pick up a three-month-old infant. Yes. All right, thanks. I think it'd be easier if Mrs. Rock was in another part of the house when they come. Yes. I'll call you as soon as the examination's completed. you'd like a cup of tea. It'll make you feel better. Leave me alone. Please, Kathy, don't be like this. It was an accident. Don't blame me for it. You were alone with him. You were supposed to take care of him. But I did. The last time I looked at him, he was all right. Listen, Laura, when I put him to bed, he was on his back. I remember distinctly. I pinned down the sides of the blanket so he wouldn't kick them off. 
He couldn't have rolled over, Laura. You know that as well as I do. What do you mean? What are you trying to say? He didn't roll over by himself. Somebody turned him over. They turned his face in that pillow when he smothered to death. No, Kathy, no. You turned him over, Laura. That's right, isn't it? You turned him over. Did you, Laura? You didn't tell Dr. Barton that. Did you turn the baby over? Jerry, you have to believe me. I wouldn't hurt your baby. I loved him. But you turned him face down in that pillow, didn't you? You smothered him. It was your fault. You killed my baby. No, Kathy. No, you can't believe that. I loved him. You know that. If it was my fault, I'd never forgive myself. If it was your fault, who else can you blame? You were alone with him. Then you turned him over, didn't you? You put his face in that pillow, didn't you? Why did you do it? After I put him to bed, why did you go upstairs and, and turn him over? I just wanted to hold him, that's all. Whenever I take care of him, whenever you and Jerry are gone, I... Well, I always go up and hold him for a few seconds. I never woke him up. I just wanted to hold him, that's all. He was such a sweet little baby. I just like to hold him. Why did you turn his face down in the crib? Why did you do it? I don't know. Why did you I don't know. I've got to know he was my baby. I didn't mean it. I don't know. I didn't mean it. The function of the coroner's office is to investigate all sudden and unexpected deaths. Very often, the apparent cause of death turns out not to have been the real cause. What might appear to have been only an accident sometimes turns out to be a case of homicide. The protection of the public interest is the motivating principle behind the work of the coroner or the medical examiner. For this, he must amass and collect a body of irrefutable facts, dispassionate facts gained by expert medical skill, facts that, if need be, can stand up in court. To collect these facts, the medical examiner works with extreme care, searching, analyzing, checking his findings. Ben, Rockwell Charles released. I'll sign the book. And take the uh, coaches over to the bacteriology lab, please. Sure. assure you of at this time is that the child was not injured in any way. I can't answer that question yet. I have to examine some tissues with the microscope before I can tell what actually caused the child's death. Yes, I understand. All right. Goodbye. The medical examiner is an expert pathologist, and with the microscope, he can probe into the most deeply hidden secrets. The evidence is there on slides for him to discover. The preparation of a slide is a meticulous and time-consuming operation. The tissues that are to be studied are first fixed in formalin, then the water is taken from the tissues. This process is carried out mechanically in the laboratory by the use of the autotechnicon. Infiltrated tissue is then embedded in paraffin blocks and cut into thin ribbons, which measure approximately one four thousandth of an inch in thickness. After that, the tissues are floated onto the surface of a glass slide and then stained with dyes to bring out the cellular details. A cover slip is then put over the tissue on the slide. The slide is labeled for identification, and the evidence is ready for the pathologist's examination.
Kathy? All finished? Everything's ready. They said the truck would be by sometime this afternoon to pick it up. All right. Miss Hill of the orphanage said they appreciated it very much. You'd better be going. You'll be late for work. Right. What about Laura? I haven't seen her. I haven't spoken to her. Kathy, you can't go on like this. What's done is done. Nobody's to blame. We all live in the same house. She is your sister. She has been good to us. How about it, huh? You're going to be late. Oh, and thank the people at the office for their cards. It's very nice of them. All right. I'll be home early. Bye. Have a nice day. Ask me to give you these slides on the Rockwell case, Doctor. Thank you, Ben. Many things which are not apparent to the naked eye become readily visible when they are magnified under the microscope. Thus, any abnormality of bone, skin, nerve, muscle, and every other body structure can be seen and its importance interpreted. Little by little, the facts begin to present themselves. you, I'm sorry. All I can say is I love both of you. I hope someday you'll forgive me. Didn't you talk to her before she left? Didn't you even see her? She left without saying a word. I haven't any idea where she is. All right, Kathy, but that doesn't prove anything. We just can't jump to conclusions. You were there that night, Jerry. She practically admitted it. I don't buy it, Kathy. Why would she? What conceivable reason would she have? Jerry, when I was a young girl, my sister was already an old maid. Well, almost anyway. When I started having parties, going on dates, having boyfriends, I think that's when she started hating me. She had nothing. I don't know why, but no one seemed to like her. I don't think she had two or three dates all the time she was in school. She didn't fit in. She didn't even try to make friends. I think that's why she hated me. I don't get it. Why should she hate you? I don't know, Jerry. I think Laura... Laura felt I had everything easy all my life. I had everything. Everything she didn't have home of my own. You, a baby. She's always been jealous. That's why she did it. Now, wait a minute, honey. I think you've got Laura all wrong. She's been here over five years. There's never been anything like that between the two of you. I wish I could agree with you, Jerry, but I can't. I know she did it. I know it. Hello? Yes, this is Mr. Rockwell. Oh, yes, doctor. You will? Good. Of course we'll be there. Thank you, Doctor. Goodbye. That was the coroner's office, Dr. Barden. What did he say? We have an appointment tomorrow morning, 11 a.m. He'll have the results of the examination for us. That's the plain, simple truth of the matter, Ms. Rockwell. Your baby did not smother. But he was lying face down in his crib. His little face was buried in the pillow. My sister told me. 
A healthy baby will never suffocate that way. It can always raise its head and cry. Then how did it happen? Jerry was healthy. How did it happen? We've examined our findings thoroughly, Mr. Rockwell. Your baby was suffering from an acute inflammation of the air passages. Are you sure of that, Doctor? He seemed perfectly all right when we left him. There wasn't a thing wrong with him. I will show you if you like. Here we are. Acute laryngotracheobronchitis. How did it happen? What does it mean? Well, let me show you. And very simply put, it means an infection of the larynx. Here we are. The Adam's apple. The trachea, which is the windpipe. The bronchi, which are the air passages. Well, is that always fatal? Only occasionally. But every year, a certain number of children are carried off by this infection and inflammation of the air passages. Unfortunately, we don't know why. We just know that it happens. There may be no warning that there's anything wrong with the child. But if it was an infection, what caused it? We don't know. But where infection may be a factor, we take material at the time of the examination for bacteriologic study to determine what organism may be present. In this particular case, we don't know what bacteria or germ is responsible. We're working on the problem. We'll pin it down someday. In the meantime, we just don't know. Laura. Poor Laura. I can tell you this. No one is responsible for your baby's death. He died of natural causes. Don't blame yourselves. Don't blame anyone else. Laura. Hello, Jerry. Oh, where have you been? Where did you go? We've been phoning all over town for you. Come on in. I'm sorry if I closed you in. Laura. Laurie. Oh, please stop saying you're sorry. Jerry and I saw Dr. Bowden this morning. He told us what really happened. I know. I saw him too, this afternoon. Oh, Laurie, can you ever forgive me? Can you? Come on, come on. What you need right now is a nice cup of tea. I'll have it ready in just a minute. No. You must be tired. You come in and sit down and I'll make the tea. That's my job, honey. I'm not good at very many things. But there's one thing I can do, and that's make a nice cup of tea. The coroner's office is really a public health office. Here, the medical examiner studies the dead in order to help the living. His work may help convict the guilty, and what is more important, perhaps, exonerate the innocent. He frequently comes across information which does great service by pointing out the presence of contagious diseases which have gone otherwise undetected. His work may result in the discovery of industrial hazards, which are a threat to the health and lives of exposed workers. And finally, as in tonight's case, his work may offer a measure of comfort to those who have suffered a tragic loss. He is often able to remove the bitterness and sense of guilt, which added to sorrow, make a loss the more tragic.